I, as a normal academic, abhorred social media. I refused to get on to Facebook or Twitter. Um, but I was really in, uh, intrigued, kind of like I am for designing for VR, AR, this opportunity to leverage social networks and, um, and concepts like story to create good in the world. And we, my husband and, uh, and I at the time were playing with this idea of writing a book called The Dragonfly Effect. So as a, as a baby step into that possibility, I taught a class called Power of Social Technology. And one of my students um, invited Robert to come. I don't know who Robert is. Robert seems just like a, a guy who likes tech, you know, which was like most of the people there. He comes up to me and he says, can I have your Twitter handle? I'd like to tweet that I'm in the class. And I had to go, oh yes, absolutely, just one sec. And then I called my husband, I said, do I have a Twitter handle? <laughs> um, because Robert wants, and, he, and he, I think he quickly got me one and <laughs> said it's at Auker. So I come back to Robert and I say, I do, at Auker, of course. And he, um, he tweets me and it was this visceral feeling of like, like adrenaline surge as about 500 people within the space of two minutes start following me. Um, so that was my Robert Scoble story. Um, it's really an honor to have Robert here. He just wrote a book called The Fourth Transformation and we were noodling on what he could do with this designing for VR, AR class. Um, and he talked about Meron, about Eric, about all of the people that he was working with and he thought wouldn't it be interesting to have very tight talks, just 10 minute talks. We're opening up this and live streaming it. And then, um, and then he'll curate a conversation. So it's less a panel and more a focus on the future of AR and VR and mixed reality more generally. Um, and then there'll be a, an interactive um, piece of it. So that's what we're gonna do today. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce um, all of our guests to the class and to give you some context, these are 40 people um, who are in undergrad, grad, and then the, the GSB, who are all you know, excited, thrilled about mixed reality more generally. And then because we're trying to create more content that's open, um, we also invited the uh, wait list um, for the class, and so that's who's here, and we're really honored to have you here and I'm hoping you can um, introduce the guest as well. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Um, I'm honored to be here, and, and particularly at this point in time, because in, I believe in June, Apple is about to announce more new technologies than it has ever shipped in its uh, history. They're preparing a new iPad, a new TV, a new watch, three new iPhones, um, uh, and new glasses, all mixed reality, um, all that are going to be a lot smaller than the HoloLens, which I'm holding. The HoloLens, if you haven't seen it, uh, has sensors on it, senses the room you're in, and puts virtual things on top of it. It does full-on next-generation augmented reality or mixed reality that I, that we call it, and it's quite exciting, right? Um, you know, when you have mixed reality, you can uh, have aliens coming through your walls, and you can walk around these things coming through the walls and shoot them with your fingers, and it's quite crazy. This is also going to bring us. Uh, virtual reality inside here. In fact, I have a little video that shows that. Oh yeah, let's talk about this. <coughs> so at C I, I just came back from CES and Sundance, so I'm fairly up to date on what's what's coming soon. The thing on the on the right is a pair of Lumis, is a Lumis lens in that green glass that has a 720p monitor on it, and it's the same thickness as the Snapchat spectacles. And it's going to cost less than $500. And it's less than four ounces. And Apple is uh, rumored to have better lenses than this, because this was created by a company that got $60 million of investment. And Carl Zeiss is the one building the Apple Glass. So they better have a wider field of view and more resolution than this. But Apple is rumored to take everything out of the glass as that is possible. They're not going to put a computer in there like this one has. The computer is going to be in your phone, and the co the camera, the, the glasses are going to have a very small uh, computer that displays what's coming off the GPU on the phone and sends the 3D sensor reading down to the phone so that it can 
compute and generate this mixed reality world. They're hardly alone. I know nine companies at least that are developing glasses like this or optics. And uh, you're going to see HoloLens 2 soon, like in the next 18 months. You're going to see Apple come out. You're going to see Facebook come out. You're going to see Meta and uh, ODG and uh, Google. Google has invested half a billion dollars in Magic Leap. Um, which got $1.4 billion without having a customer or a product, so that proves you don't need to have adoption to get funded. <laughs> but you do have to have a badass CEO who can convince people to put the kind of investment in. Anyways, our world is about to change, is where I'm going with this. And <clears throat> when you do get mixed reality, you get uh, virtual reality and augmented reality at the same time. Uh, this is a little video that's done through the HoloLens, and he's showing you how he can have a virtual door right here, and you can walk through that door, and now you're in a virtual space, and I can't see you, right? I'm just in a virtual uh, space. This is one advantage of, the, of these systems, because they are going to know every surface in here. In fact, uh, there was a company from uh, Israel that visited me a month ago called Yauza. And it takes 3D images of this space and converts everything that's on the table into a separate object. So like the Macintosh is up there, it knows it's a separate object from the table it's on. And then it starts doing AI lookup on those objects. So as I walk around, it's starting to see <laughs> logos and other features along the sides. And it's trying to figure out what kind of computer that is. I, I used a... Um, a system from iFluence that Google just bought. iFluence is an eye sensor company. In fact, I think I have a little lab of that. Sorry, you're getting 45 minutes of video <laughs> in a few seconds. Ah, oh, there we go. Uh, here, can we? Do you have sound in this room? If yep. not, I'll make it up as he's talking. So iFluence. These glasses are going to soon have eye sensors in them that are going to watch your eyes move around. And we're going to see new kinds of operating systems that are going to be developed. In fact, that's why I invited Mehran to come and talk with us, because he's building an operating system for these glasses. And he's also a neuroscientist. So yeah, there we go. Yeah. So I, I, that's one reason I invited Mehran along. And we're going to talk about operating systems for these glasses and where you think the brain machine interface, the human machine interface, is about to go. Because he's one of the first people who showed me uh, gestures on hands. His, his glasses see your hands and let us do things with our fingers and soon with our eyes and with our voice. So we're going to control these uh, devices in new ways. And let's just watch a little bit. This is Jim Margraf, who started iFluence, just got sold to Google. Uh, watch the screen over on the left as he uses his eyes to control. Some electronics in our office, and I can go home when I want to. Over here is a medical application, and um, I'm all with your it. eyes. All with my eyes. So I'm doing this solely with my eyes, as fast as I can look. I'm not waiting. I'm not winking. I'm just looking. And here I've got uh, um, the patient. I've got some allergy record pr protocols, insurance, confidential information, current conditions. Why is he here? Well, he tells me he's got a pain in his foot. Notice I'm looking at this, but there's nothing happening on the screen. But when I decide, for instance, that I want to check out his x-ray, there it is. And now I want to go back because a couple screens ago there was some confidential information, which is here. And um, now it's going to take a picture of my eye. It grabs it, says, oh, who is that? Confirms that it's me. And in a moment, you'll see that it'll give me access. I'm Jim, head of uh, CEO and founder of, of iFluence. And there it is. I've got confidential information. When I want to, I can return home as fast as that. That's amazing. All of my eyes. That's amazing. <clears throat> now, I filmed this at South by Southwest last year, so almost a year ago. And he showed me a new glass that he's working on and a new operating system. And he said, pull something out of your pocket. I pulled out my iPhone, put it on the table. He said, look at it. And a menu popped off the iPhone. And let me see what that it, first of all, it recognized accurately. It was an iPhone 6S Plus. 
and then a menu popped off and said, would you like information on it or would you like to buy it? The price is $699 on Amazon, all with my eyes. So think about walking around using my eyes on various things to control display surfaces and menus and all sorts of fun stuff. Um, we could talk about this stuff for hours <laughs> and not touch much of it, right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm real honored here. We're going to um, bring up uh, Mayron, who is uh, building the operating system for these glasses. And then I'm going to bring up um, Allspace VR, uh, uh, Eric. Jim Romo, who is uh, building this as a social space. So we're going to hear from two different points of view in this new and up and coming industry. Two different people who are building, one is building a social experience that you can go and dance in, or I give a, bo a book reading like this in, in all space we are, and you can do a lot of different things there. Meta is um, building glasses that are similar to HoloLens, has a sensor to sense the room, has optics that put virtual things on top of the real world, and Soon we'll have other things, so I'll let them talk. I'm going to introduce them, and then we'll come back and get deeper into it. So thank you very much. And I'll just uh, I think we're going to start with Eric. Is that good? Sure. Yeah, that's yeah. fine. Yeah. Right. yeah, sounds good. Sounds good. I don't have any slides. I'll just. That's I'll, 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 I'll talk one. to Robert's slides. Yeah, uh, maybe. So uh, actually, yeah. I do have all space VR on one. Oh, of my you got slides. you got one. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Perfect. So uh, yeah, my name is Eric Romo. I'm the founder and CEO of All Space VR. Um, it's uh, it's great to be here actually because I was uh, in your seats about a dozen years ago. So I'm a GSB06. Um, I guess not not literally in your seats because this was a parking lot at that point. Um, uh, but in a, in a much less nice building than this uh, a dozen years ago. So uh, I left business school. I started a solar technology company uh, called Greenvolts. I, I, I helped run that for about six and a half years uh, and then made the very obvious transition from solar technology to virtual reality. Uh, now, I got, I got bit by the bug in VR probably about 2010. Um, and then in 2011, I, I read a book uh, by a guy named Jeremy Balenson, who I, I gather you just met. Um, Jeremy runs the Virtual Human Interaction Lab here, the VR lab at Stanford. Uh, and this got me really thinking about human connection in VR and how we connect and how we interact uh, with people. Um, I'll get to that in a second. I, I think uh, one thing I wanted to mention that's slightly off that topic is I think it's really exciting uh, that you guys have this, this concept of this class designing for AR VR because um, there's a lot going on in the hardware and the technology and the software. It's really confusing. Uh, it's confusing to us in this space. So many different things and headsets and operating systems. Um, my, my advice to you in thinking about this class is get past that as fast as possible. Because what you want to get to is you want to get to what really connects people, what really moves people about these technologies. Um, uh, engineers like me, I'm a mechanical engineer by background. I worked at SpaceX before business school. Um, we get really caught up in all the, the numbers and details and pixel densities and display resolutions and all this stuff. What really matters is what's going to move people. What is it that's going to, going to really get to your core? What's going to move you emotionally? Why are you going to use these technologies? Why do you care? And I think designing uh, uh, in VR, designing in AR, gets the, the heart of that. Why do we want to do these things? So uh, we're, we're, some folks have mentioned what people call a social VR company. Um, this is where we're lumped into that space and with a few other folks, including our, our friends in, in Menlo Park. Um, and uh, we really think that's kind of a misnomer. You know, the way we think about virtual reality is, is as a medium for communication. So we think of ourselves, we think of ourselves as a communications company, the same way you might think about uh, video chat or audio chat or text messages being a methodology of electronic communication, a medium of electronic communication. We think about VR as something that's going to enable a new kind of connection. Uh, so much so that, it, that we have a thesis that if VR is going to be successful uh, commercially, it will be because people are connecting. <coughs> If it's going to be something that's well beyond uh, gamers and some entertainment, it's because people are feeling a, an emotional connection that wasn't available to them before. Uh, so the question that we ask ourselves is, is you know, what do we get from VR? What, what, what are the things about VR that makes it uh, a new medium? And you know, when, I, when I started researching the space, it started with the, the neuroscience of connection and, and how our brains uh, would use VR and, and reading things like what uh, Professor, Professor Balenson works on. Um, and, and VR, if nothing else, is really a, a tool for fooling your brain into thinking you're someplace else. 
And so uh, if we can fool you to think you're someplace else, we can fool you to think you're there with other people. And so then the question is, what is it that we get from being actually physically present from, with other people that we don't get in electronic communications media? What is it that's different about this experience of sitting in a room together than, than watching this on a YouTube live stream? You know, how different is the experience that you're having than, than that they're having? And uh, you could argue that, well, you know, they see the same guy in a blue sweater uh, saying the same words at the same time, actually 30 or 45 seconds later probably, right? Uh, so you could argue that the information conveyed is largely similar. But I think you would never make the argument that sitting in the audience at a TED Talk is the same as watching a TED Talk on YouTube. Yep. That sitting in the audience at a comedy show is the same as watching a comedy special on Netflix. That being at a concert is the same as listening to a CD of a concert. That being in the same room with your family is the same as being on video chat with your family. I think you'd never make that. So if you think about that problem and say decompose what is it that we get when we're physically together that we don't have on these, these electronic media? Well, it's things like this. I can choose which of you I am interacting with and what we see together. Sorry. That's OK. <laughs> uh, what, how we feel when we interact uh, when we make eye contact is, is dramatically different than how we can feel in video chat. Our ability to change the distance of how far we are from each other connotes something. <laughs> Right? We feel that sense of physical space that we don't have uh, on video chat. I have the ability to draw your attention to something and to know if you're looking at it. So this is all what we talk about as nonverbal communication. You're all intimately aware of the people who are to your left and right, even if you don't interact with them, even if you're not talking to them, you're not looking at them, you know there's somebody there. And that feeling of being in this crowd, that emotion that comes from that, the connection that comes from that, is something that you don't have in electronic communications media but you do have in virtual reality. So the first thing that we really get when we're together that we also get in virtual reality that we don't have in video chat, that we don't have in phone calls, is nonverbal communication. This way to communicate we call net more naturally than you can communicate otherwise online. Yeah. Okay, the second big thing you get in VR that you don't have in, in video chat or audio chat is what we call the context of communication. What can we do together? You think about video chat, you pretty much stare at each other and talk. Actually, you stare kind of at each other. Mostly, you look at your picture in the bottom right-hand corner, right? Uh, you think about a phone call, all you can do is talk. Okay? You can maybe find a counterexample in video games or something. You can talk while you play a video game. But most of the time, when we get together socially, we get together from a professional setting, there's something we're doing together that forms the centerpiece of that communication. So you think about when you get together with friends. You play a card game, you, go, you cook, you throw a frisbee, you go for a walk, you watch a movie. Uh, think about when you get together in a business setting. You're going to have a whiteboard. You're going to have slides, some kind of presentation. You have documents you're reviewing. There's some media. There's some something that forms the centerpiece of most of our communications experiences. And most of the time, electronically, that's really terrible. You know, you're trying to do a whiteboarding session on Skype or, or, or uh, on Google Hangouts. It's a, it's a miserable experience. And this is why we fly, as I once did, 18 hours each way to Santiago, Chile for a 90-minute meeting. It's absurd. It's absurd. If you think about, really think about why we travel all this distance, it's for simple things like that, for nonverbal communication and for the ability to have context of communication. So in VR, we see as this medium where we start to get that stuff back. And that's really exciting. So we think about what this is going to be. That's what we focus on. Now, I gather you all visited the Virtual Human Interaction Lab today, which is awesome, the VR lab at Stanford. We only started calling it the VR lab a few years ago when VR got cool. It used to be the <laughs> VHIL. Um, uh, but I think one of the things that I, I, I'll touch upon, because I think it's so core to this concept of connecting, and, and I know you were just there, um, is how people think about uh, communicating in virtual spaces. Because I put on this headset, right, uh, and I look around this room and I see other people, but I don't see photorealistic representations of people, I see avatars. And that consciously, for most people, when they hear that, when they see pictures of that, and they might see videos of that, yeah. they think, gosh, I'm not going to like that. I don't think I personally, yeah, yeah, Eric, you can stand up on stage and tell me you're going to be, feel emotionally connected, but I don't think I personally am going to be emotionally connected by that. It's a really fascinating piece uh, of, of research that they've done. They've done tons of studies on this stuff, and, and the way I would summarize it for you, and you can suspend your disbelief until you have experiences around this, um, is that we consciously expect that we're not going to enjoy these experiences and not be connected with these, uh, these, these people these, as avatars. But subconsciously, when you measure what happens, when you actually get into the experience and you see their, people's responses and you, you ob ob objectively measure it rather than subjectively measure it, they are connected. And in fact, they can be more connected than when I talk on video chat and I kind of can't make eye contact with you. 
And so even when those avatars are tremendously abstract, as you'll see spheres with two dots for eyes, okay? And if that sphere with two dots for eyes gets really close to you, you're going to feel like there's a person there. So since you were there, I just wanted and, to touch upon that. But, and, and not just people. The, the reason I put this video up, this is uh, me playing in Chris Milk's latest creation, uh, Life With Us, at Sundance last week. And I'm playing with Anne, Anne Greenberg, who started Grace Note next to me. So we're both in this experience. And Chris takes you on a journey from an egg to uh, adulthood um, and takes you through a number of different characters. So instantly, he throws you off a, off a cliff, and you're flying. And within, sec within a second, I, I watched several people play it. Within a second, everybody got, oh, wait a second, I have wings? I can fly? Oh, I'm flying. Yeah. Right? And uh, you have uh, empathy for that uh, character, and you start uh, behaving like that character. You start running when you're uh, a, a dinosaur uh, or an ape. I think I'm an ape right now <laughs> with a monkey on my back, <laughs> which is sort of funny. You can grab the monkey and throw him off, right? And grab the monkey off your friend who's playing with you and throw, throw them off. But you quickly get into that, and the voices he is pushing back at you are your own voices, but changed to the character that you're seeing on the screen in, in, in VR. So it's quite fascinating, and it shows you the state of the art of social behaviors in a, a VR setting. Right? This is one of these things. I've been doing this for, for four years now, and, and uh, I have this experience over and over again where I can talk until I'm blue in the face about how you're going to feel in situations like this or in social VR. And people say, yeah, yeah, I get it. And then 90 seconds into actually having that experience, how they feel is, is dramatically transformed. So uh, suspend your disbelief and, and enjoy. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. 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 So Mehran, um, uh, God, how do I explain how I met you? I, the first time I met him, he had uh, 30 nerds up in this mansion up in Woodside with a bunch of uh, tank collection in the backyard, <laughs> which was there from the guy who owned the mansion back then. And Actually the largest private collection of military tanks in the world. Yeah, not anymore because the he family sold, sold all. all off. But uh, his team was building software to s study gestures. And it uh, took me back to my time at Microsoft when I got a, a tour of Microsoft Research. I worked there for three years. And Andy Wilson had a lab there and was showing me uh, how his algorithms would see your fingers closing and would uh, give you a control surface on those uh, fingers, gestures, right? And you could do things with your hands to zoom in on maps and stuff like that. And you guys took that to a whole new level and impressed me a lot. And uh, you're still on this mission because your mission is to bring us these glasses that will do wondrous things. So take it away, Thank and you. I'll turn, off, you, turn this off. Otherwise, Thanks. it will be very Thanks distracting for, for you. Jennifer. Um, and thanks for having me, everyone. So <clears throat> I want to tell you a little bit about my company, about uh, why we're building an operating system for the mind, for augmented reality, what that kind of an operating system might look like, um, and what's our focus in, uh, as it compares to everyone else. You're, you're hearing a lot about augmented and virtual reality, I'm sure. So let's try and make sense of all of this. So we build augmented reality glasses that are very immersive. They allow you to see um, pretty much photorealistic imagery in space. Um, and you have this large screen to be able to, to see it. But you also see the real world in the background. Um, and you can touch these holograms with your very hands. You can interact collaboratively and that kind of a thing. So that's, that's the basics of what, you know, what Meta does. It's very similar to the Microsoft HoloLens in some ways. However, um, unlike other people out there, we're really kind of obsessed with building the most optimal operating system that really feels like an extension of your imagination. Because the power in our minds of holograms is to be able to simplify computing. In essence, we believe that your Iron Man, Tony Stark workspace is going, can, can allow you to create a much easier computing experience if I'm surrounded by 3D models that work the way my brain does in 3D and I can collaborate with you and we can pass each other files back and forth and I might have some supplementary panel information that we can discuss um, and I might have a 3D Skype person kind of holographically telepresence into the room and have a natural discussion the way we, we are here. 
then computing can be simplified dramatically. So that's our mission statement, is really to drive towards a zero learning curve computing experience, whatever that is. Um, my grandmother, we bought her an iPad, and of course, this is the first time she was able to adopt computers uh, or computing. And what's the killer app for old people? Solitaire. 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 Okay, so close. Solitaire was on Windows 95, but she couldn't get that, and that's the whole basis for my speech today. <laughs> <laughs> Words with friends getting there, warming up. Scrabble, Scrabble. even simpler. Looking at pictures of her grandkids. <laughs> so pinch to zoom, that was the killer app for my grandma, right? There's a zero learning curve computing experience that you just don't have um, in Windows 95 before. So she was able to adopt computing for the very first time. But when we told her grandma, change the brightness on your iPad, <coughs> no way. You have to go through a series of complex menus and buttons and icons, abstractions, to get to that point where you're changing the brightness. She couldn't figure it out. So there's a lot of learning curves still inside the easiest to use operating system in the world, iOS. And what we think we can do with AR is eradicate that learning curve completely and make something that really is as natural and as simple as that pinch to zoom across the whole OS and a set of applications to allow you to do that. The reason I put this girl behind you um, this four-year-old came into this is my house, and she came into my house and Im immediately picked up the uh, headset and the controllers without talking to anybody. She'd never been in it before, and with zero instructions, she just went to town. And I, 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 I talked to you about this, that this is your goal to make every experience in computing this easy for people to pick up. We're going to be talking about this very application in just a moment, Tilt Brush. Uh, which I hope we've all tried because it's freaking awesome. Um, and it allows you to draw holographically in space in virtual reality. Now, this ability of a two-year-old child or an 80-year-old grandfather to just pick up the tool and start drawing, start working, is something that is completely uh, distinguishable from any computing paradigm before it, from anything you can do on a Windows or even an iOS uh, device. So we're going to get to it in just a moment. So that's what we build. Meta augment, builds uh, augmented reality holographic tools that allow any thinker or builder or creator to visualize their imagination and their work in space. So everyone in this room would be able to use um, our headset for something. And uh, we can get into the specifics of that in just a moment. So Jennifer asked me to focus on how we create open an open culture that is empathetic to the market and to uh, our employees and, and our partners. Um, so I have two, two examples of this. The first is um, us opening our offices this quarter. So we're about 150 people now um, at San Mateo. We took over GoPro's old office space. And um, for those of you who might have seen my TED talk from last year, we promised a pretty bombastic promise. And that was that we were going to, by TED of 2017, throw away all of our external monitors, essentially throw away our, our monitors, our beloved multi-screen you know, station uh, into the garbage and replacing it with an AR experience. So um, the, why, why did we do this? We did this because there was a sensation in the market that there's that AR and VR, uh, especially AR, are vaporware, that it's not real, that it's far away from being useful. And um, by us embodying and really trying out these use cases um, and being the first AR-enabled office place in the world, we were hoping to dispel that. Now, you might have heard of um, some woes that a uh, competitor of ours has got in, gotten into in the last few months because of overhyping a technology and not being there when it comes to the, the actual product. So we're hoping to undo that um, and bring in people into our company. So this openness is very literal. We're inviting anyone, any academic, any journalist, anyone to come over to our offices and experience what it might look like to be inside of augmented reality exclusively without a traditional computer. Um, and that should be a really exciting quarter for us um, as we throw away all of our monitors. And that means everyone, the engineer, my assistant, me, everyone. So that's the first way. The second way is um, 
remember we're focused in on, on this operating system, this holy grail of computing that uh, will simplify things for grandmothers across the land. Um, now, we believe the pathway to that is by understanding how grandma and grandpa like to process information. In other words, neuroscience. So by understanding cognitive neuroscience is fairly in depth and creating a set of simple design guidelines, we believe we can create that experience, the tilt brush experience, and create an infinite number of applications that feel as simple as that, uh, that computing experience. So I'd like to tell you about a couple of those um, principles. But before I do, I'll just say that we're open sourcing our design guidelines for designing this OS. And that's another way we're trying to open up to the community. And you might ask, well, why, why on earth would you do that? And uh, if your focus in such a crowded, complex ecosystem is on the, the operating system, why would you tell your competitors how to build it? The answer is, like in virtual reality, if one person gets a negative experience, it tends to reflect on the rest of the industry. So my hope is that our competitors will look into these design guidelines and will try and make more delightful computing experiences that will uplift the whole industry. So that's the, the uh, uh, design guidelines. Let's talk about just two of them, and then we'll wrap up and pass the mic back. So tilt brush, so, so cool, right? And this comes from a competitor. This comes from originally uh, Oculus had a demo, and now the Vive. Um, this is made was, by Google, yeah. And it was, made, it was made by Skillman and Hackett that were bought by Google. And look at that, the transmitting or, of imagination into creation. In a sense, there's no latency between the two. We've increased the I.O. between man and machine with this kind of an application. And I think that um, with a set of about 10 simple, easy to understand design guidelines, anyone can build a tilt brush. And tilt brush is considered in many circles the killer app of VR. It's a driving adoption in many senses of virtual reality, even more than the games um, that people thought would drive adoption. So two uh, little stories on how to build a tilt brush. Um, the first is our principle, which is called minimize abstractions. So minimize abstractions um, has to do with our philosophy around spatial computing. Spatial graphical user interface, we believe, is the next 50 years or, of computing. It's going to engulf every AR and VR uh, company that is trying to build an operating system will adopt roughly the spatial computing. So let's go, go ahead and define it. But before we do, let's define what it's changing, what it's disrupting. This is the Windows graphical user interface sort of summarized by the acronym WIMP, Windows, Icons, Menus, and Pointers, uh, created in Xerox PARC in, you know, in 72. And then uh, Steve Jobs pulled it into the, to Apple and the, for the Mac. And then Gates took it into Windows 95. iOS took it back. Fundamentally, all of these operating systems are about the metaphor of a window, being able to close it, being, seeing your uh, home screen, iconography, menus. That's what the last 50 years of computing is. That's where your imaginations have been trapped in the last 50 years of computing. <coughs> and what we're hoping is that the next 50 years will free them like that tilt brush experience. And here's a, a, a particular way that we can do this. The first principle we call minimize abstraction. So if in the old world it was about menus and windows and all this complexity, the new world is about two things and two things alone, tools and content. That's it. That's, that's the, all the animals that matter in the new world. So let's imagine Photoshop of the past, right? Photoshop of the past. It's riddled with all this abstraction, different layering systems, side panels crowding on top of each other. How long does it take me to get to the damn paintbrush and customize it? By the time I got there, I got burnt out. I don't have a creation. I can't do that, for sure, um, as a novice in, in Photoshop. That's the old world. But what's the new world look like? when it comes just to tools and content and AR or VR? Well, it's as simple as seeing that paintbrush, picking it up, and maybe putting on a different uh, uh, header to it, dipping it in some paint, and starting to paint. And that, that process is, is, is where computing is going, into tools and content. Those are the two buckets. So how do we design these tools? We're talking about designing for AR, VR. And I'll wrap up in just about a minute. 
We design them with affordances. We take cues from the industrial design world. Affordances are these uh, things like a, a, a handle for a teacup uh, or the little nooks on the side of a, of a hammer where it tells me how to grab it. These things essentially tell the brain how to grab it. Now, Professor Rizzolatti in 2001 discovered, and all of our gu guidelines are anchored on neuroscience, he discovered that there's this area called R4, sorry, F4 in the uh, motor cortex, which is um, controlling the movement of the hand, that looks at objects, at the characteristics of objects, and reverse engineers the, 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 those characteristics to create an automatic series of motor commands to allow you to reach out and grab the object. So the object is telling you how to use it. That's what we're talking about. That's how you eradicate the learning curve from computing. So that's one way in which we, uh, uh, we're going to create a bunch of tilt brushes together. And the other way is um, what we call augmented, not mixed reality. Robert likes to, this term mixed reality, and I don't. And today we're going to have a little <laughs> bit of a debate. All right. <laughs> so um, uh, Professor Aker asked me to, to imagine the future with you guys uh, and conclude the, this talk. So I want you to imagine that yourself in about five years waking up uh, in bed and rolling over and reaching for that familiar thing, hopefully for our shareholders, that's not an iPhone. That's a pair of AR glasses. And how do these glasses look? They look like a strip of glass that's nearly invisible. From the distance that we're standing from each other, they're even less of a visual footprint than my glasses. You put these glasses, this strip of glass on, and you can see photorealistic light field holograms. My friends, we're working on these kinds of glasses. Magically, Microsoft, everyone is. And this hardware, I promise you, will soon be commoditized. So when you talk about getting away from talking about specs and obsessing on the pixel size, that's wise. Because what, well, the important thing is what you put inside of these glasses. And every little nuance and difference is going to change the lives of everyone adopting this afterwards. I was just sitting with Scott Forstel in my office a couple of, uh, a couple of days ago. Scott was the designer of uh, iOS. He essentially is responsible for a lot of the iPhone. And he's, he's looking around in SFO at an army of people just hunching over. And he says, it, you know, really ups it upset, it's upsetting what world we brought forward, you know, what, what we've created. Hey, at and least we're not locked to our desks anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I told him I think we've turned into a species of phone monkeys. But that's just my thing. Um, so I said, yes, we got to fix this. And this is how we can fix it. We have a few different ways. So you put on this strip of glass back into that morning. And the first thing you see is an explosion on the side of your wall, just like you saw in this uh, HoloLens thing. And a dinosaur comes rushing in. And this dinosaur is photorealistic. And that hole looks as real as can be. And it sure as hell wakes you up better than a coffee. And this dinosaur is running through the room with a notification in its mouth. Did you forget milk this morning? Notification from your wife. <laughs> Given through the dinosaur. I don't know. I'm just making this UI up. <laughs> so this is option A. It's called mixed reality. Mixed reality means to warp a part of your reality like a wall and blast a hole through it and change it to warp it. Let's imagine a different reality. You put on your headset, nothing happens until you want it to. You get up, you go to Crystal Lakes, you take a little bit of a, of a jog by the side of the lake. And on the side, you see a flower that kind of attracts you. It's interesting. And you touch it. And right next to it comes a meta user interface, a meta UI like metadata. That's how I'm using the word meta now. That just tells you, it's a wiki panel that tells you how much DNA you share with the flower. So, it enriches, it deepens the relationship between you and the world. Okay? And then you keep, keep jogging, keep going on your jog, and you see someone at a distance, and that person is from this class, from Jennifer's class. And you didn't know that because they're joggers at a distance. And it turns out that you could see with a panel right next to them that they can also see, so it's not creepy like Google Glass, that they um, are also Grateful Dead fans like you. So by the time they arrive, by the time you cross paths, 
you can reach out, shake their hand, become friends on Facebook perhaps, and continue the run. This is another example of a meta UI that deepens your connection with the real world and with each other people in the real world. So I want to create that world, uh, a world where, where it's not distorted, it's not manipulated, but it's rather augmented. And that's why I love this term, augmented. So that's our last principle. It's called augmented, not mixed. There's a lot of neuroscience to suggest why it's better to not have dinosaurs breaking through walls um, and that change all of your, what we call, uh, Bayesian priors of your brain, your mental model of your brain. All the time can change if there's no laws of physics. Um, and that can create sort of delusional thinking uh, or anxiety around what's going to happen next. So there's a lot of uh, neuroscience behind all these things, but I just wanted to give you a taste of what we think about every day. Um, and why is this important? Well, because the next 50 years of computing are going to be anchored on the next iOS. And our kids are going to grow up inside of these things, and our kids' kids. So we want to make sure they have a comfortable stay. Uh, thank you. Awesome. Come on up. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you. Um, how do I add more value to you right now? You're getting a taste, and, and in this class over the next few months, you're going to um, probably hear from some of the people who built some of the stuff I've showed you. I just came back from Sundance, and I saw films from uh, as crazy an experience that started out with uh, uh, looking at a gay sex act in, in uh, VR to um, Chris Milk's thing where you're flying through uh, space with another person is quite amazing. Um, how do, you, uh, how do you think uh, these systems will philosophically differ from each other? Because I, I sense that you have a deeper philosophical difference from some of the other people who are building these systems. Because let's go dystopian. There's a Japanese, in fact, I should pull up the Japanese video, where he puts ads on every surface. There, this Japanese uh, filmmaker made a uh, video where he pretends we're in this new world, and he puts ads and other information on every surface around you. And it sounds like you don't like that kind of future. <laughs> I hope we don't all like that. I mean, we all don't like that future. But yes, that's the future we're trying to protect against. Um, we, so, so there will be philosophical differences that are inherent in the form factor. Virtual reality seeks to pull you into another world, maybe deepen the connection with other people inside of that world. Um, in this mediation phase, but uh, mixed reality seeks to stimulate you by changing the characteristics of the world. And augmented is simply a way to enrich your life with more information about the real world, real people in the real world, and uh, objects in the real world. So I'm excited about that, and I think it's um, when we think about the far future, it's gonna it's gonna go inside of glasses, and then who knows, you know, brain computer interfaces in the future, who knows where it's gonna go. But as we become more intimately connected with the machine, we want to make sure that it's a great experience. Because um, it's so easy to manipulate someone's thoughts. Uh, and we show the neuroscience of how easy it is to generate delusions in a healthy person's mind. Um, that, that we think we have a bit of a We should talk about, about these downsides. In my book, we have a whole chapter on possible downsides, control of people delusions and other things. We should talk about that. The upside is this is a drug. I, I've been telling my friends this is LSD for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because if I want that wall to be a multicolored uh, array yeah. of ants, I can make it happen. In fact, yeah. I'm starting to write a, a list of rules of this new mixed reality yeah. rule world. And the first rule is there's nothing you can tell me about this world that is false. <laughs> <laughs> Visually, at right. least. Right. Um, I thought it was going to be no multicolored ants. The first rule. No, 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 no multi. No, no. You, whatever you want to put on that wall, you the can key make. Is, yeah. The key is, Robert, it's fine for you to pull the multicolored ants there, but you, the user, have to be in control. Yeah. And this is the nuance. Thus far, the developer is the god. And what we're trying to make sure of, as the developer gets a monopoly over your whole field of view, is that you become the controller of your own destiny. I want to put the ants on. That's my UI. That's my app. Um, but don't, don't have that automatically be part of the OS. Big no-no, I think. Yeah, it's a slippery slope, though. 
I mean, you look at the, the majority of the revenue from the major, uh, major tech companies in the Valley, now the new <coughs> breed, Google, Facebook, uh, is advertising. And so if these are going to be the companies that are the vanguard of these new technologies, whether it be AR or VR, or MR, whatever that is, uh, uh, how are they not going to cater towards that? That's where 97 <coughs> plus percent of their revenue comes from. So when, when they say, oh, it's very reasonable for me to put a little ad there and then charge you less for your headset, you know, that's, that's a step down the road. And then when they say it's very reasonable for me to have you watch an ad before you put on your headset so it's a little cheaper, that's another step down the road. So I think it's, it's going to be a big challenge because so much of the economy of, of internet companies and tech companies is built upon advertising. And so much of those companies are the ones who are spending hundreds of millions and billions of dollars on developing these technologies. That should really alarm us. It should, but it doesn't, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, we, we deal with that at Facebook. We deal with that at Twitter. We deal with that in, in the social media we use every single day. Here I, vi uh, I visited uh, Sephora's R&D lab, and they showed me augmented uh, makeup where <coughs> With your iPhone today, you can aim your iPhone at your face and try out different kinds of makeup, li lipstick and whatnot. And the, the color is matched to the physical product. So when you go to Sephora and actually buy the, the real makeup, it's matched to what you see on the screen. And imagine I ha have these glasses on. Now you could be a kiss character or some uh, weird make, made up character, right? Um, it's going to be crazy in this new world. I don't, oh, yeah, I don't know that your nuts. philosophy is going to completely win because hey, we're going to try a lot of things and I, some of them are going to work to be something. honest the, it's not a philosophy and this is what we're trying to really document in this guideline we're just trying to trying to find out how the brain likes to process information yeah. um, and if the brain like you know and there's many examples of of this but um, if the brain wants to put you know augmented costume and makeup on you right now for whatever task then that that's what it should be allowed to do um, the, 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 the problem is when the brain, when a developer decides that, and then I, a, a simple user of MR, will not know if that is real or not real, and then it becomes a slippery slope to, am I talking to Scoble here, am I talking to an AI, am I talking to uh, uh, some kind of a avatar that's completely um, photorealistic here, uh, should I shake your hand or, or will, I, will it just go through air? These kinds of confusions are just simply mental confusions, and we want to make sure that we have a guideline that allows for that beautiful, crazy future, but make sure that we're protected as we go in there. That's our, that's our goal. Talk about protection. I, yeah. I'm a, a sexual abuse victim, so I care about this topic very, very deeply. When we are in social, when we're in virtual social spaces, there will be bad actors in that's that right. so social space. How do you protect people from that kind of activity in one of these spaces? And both sure. of you can yeah, that on. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a huge challenge because uh, if the whole point of your product is to make you feel like you're there with other people, you have to choose what people you're there with. The, the early days of virtual reality, and, and to you know, set context, there's probably uh, somewhere between one and two million people a month that use virtual reality headsets in the, in the brackets that, that matter, and not in the Google Glass, Google Cardboard, excuse me, uh, uh, frame of things. Those, those are sort of irrelevant if I use them for 30 seconds. That's a long session. We're talking about uh, Samsung's Gear VR, and Oculus Rift, and HTC Vive, and Google Daydream. Um, if the whole point of those products is to make you feel like you're with other people, if you're with the wrong people, that can be an extremely negative experience. You, you do have this concept of personal space, and you do have this concept where people have hands, and when those hands come towards you, you feel like someone's hand is coming towards you. You have the same visceral emotional reaction, like this, which is a good one, this is a good, <laughs> this is a good one, uh, that you would, but if it's a stranger, that's not necessarily a good feeling, right? And so uh, where we are is in this challenging place where we, as a, I can just say for us as a company, as, as the, the social VR product people uh, use a lot, is, is that uh, we're trying to learn what makes a good user interaction in a world where most users don't actually know anybody else that has a VR headset. Yeah. I mean, the probability that your friend has a VR headset so you can hang out in, in our product or any other one is diminishingly small right now. So by definition, you have groups of people that don't know each other, and so you have this possibility for interaction. Now, what happens is, again, we try to, you're mirroring sort of what happens in real life, but the problem is in real life, you, you got a police force, and you've got somebody's cousin who's gonna punch you in the nose if you do something wrong, and you don't necessarily have that in VR. So you don't have these same social rules that you have there, so you need to design them in about how do you bring people together and how, what tools do you allow people to say, okay, yeah, you, you're out of here, and just get rid of them instantly. It's a challenging, interesting problem. I mean, it's not unlike the problems that Twitter has been totally unable to address on, on their platform, but to a, 
a, a different level because of the psychological experience of that connection. It, is it true in, in your system, it might be your system or somebody else's, but if I try to touch yep. you inappropriately, yeah, yeah, yeah. my hand turns around toward me? It just disappears the way we do it, yeah. Ah. So it disappears, it disappears for you, for everyone else, so no one can see it. Um, you know, some systems have designed it so where, you know, I try and move my hand towards you and you don't see it, but everybody else in the room sees me, you know, harassing you in some way, which is, doesn't solve the problem, we think. So the harder way to solve that was to make sure it disappears for everybody and, uh, you know, it sounds like a simple design thing, right? But it's actually a very challenging design and technical problem. What this designing this this um, world of etiquette in virtual reality is super super interesting. Um, in augmented reality, there's a there's a similar question because um, assume for a moment the term augmented reality covers a lot of things, including even Google Glass. When we had uh, Glass. People were looking at each other and they weren't really sure what was happening on the other side. There were these asymmetrical UIs that I believe was the downfall of the, of the product. More you know, than the look, which was geeky, that's fine. That, that, I, the form factor is less of, of a concern for me. It's the fact that I just don't know what you're looking at right now. I don't know if you're recording it, but uh, me right now by design, they actually designed it that way. So uh, one of our principles, and, and, and the brain has so much processing around attentional cues. Like if, I, if you're looking at me right now, I have this area in my medial temporal lobe called the fusiform gyrus, which is analyzing the whites. What? Slow state. down. <laughs> what did you just say? I, I have this area that's analyzing your facial features to, to, to know if you're paying attention to me, um, to know if you're you know, aroused by whatever I'm saying right now, etc. cetera. And uh, when you use your hands, there's this freaky cool thing, which, ha which is that the same area in your brain, if you were to move your hands like this, um, are now firing by you looking at me, moving my hands. So we're matched. Our, 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 there's this, this social uh, underpinning of empathy. So our principle, bottom line, for etiquette inside of AR is that everything has to be viewed by everyone else. It's public by default. This is one of our principles. So, oh, let's get, let's warm up. I'm trying to spice it up, guys. Come on, work with me here. Because that sounds it, crazy. I want privacy. All right, let's talk about it. If it is public, and I believe that by the end of the year, we're going to see several companies bring out a new kind of 3D map based on slam, right? Slam. Um, where the glasses are going to see this world and are going to remember it, right? If I use my HoloLens, I can put a shark here. Yeah. And if I come back a year from now, that shark will be right where I left it. Great. Right? And if I could publicly share that shark with the class, the whole class would see the shark mm -hmm. here, right? Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what we actually uh, we promote in this, in this new world. Um, we want the world to feel like an architecture office where you come to visit, you see all these beautiful creations, you can share them with one another. And if you want to chuck one, you just pick it up and throw it away, and it's gone. Uh, but you have to, um, I think, if you imagine yourself here in a couple of years in this classroom, all of us wearing our headsets, just the beautiful colors and, and mise-en-scene around us could, could, is such a cool uh, visual to have. And, and for some of that to be private or hidden from one another just because it's my creation and not yours, it deviates so much from our mental model of the real world that it's not worth it. But in my glasses, I'm watching stuff that I might not want you to see. So do what you're doing in the real world. Go to the other room and do it there. <laughs> That's my point, though. That's the nuance. It's, it's that etiquette prevails. The social norms that we're talking about for, for that sort of get into VR and control the, the way we design our UIs will be the same, I think, for augmented reality. Uh, but here's, I don't know if you guys have seen the Black Mirror episode with John Hamm where there's a, a, a fender, and uh, one person looking at that offender only sees their silhouette. Yeah. And the offender can never talk or never communicate back. It's called diminished reality. This is the opposite of all that we're talking about. Um, and that's the world that I think a few of the competitors are, are steering towards. This is my private thing. I'm going to create a silhouette around it. But here's the problem with that. When I'm talking to a silhouette, when I'm interacting with a silhouette that, that you can't see, that confuses you and just creates a lot of anxiety and Google Glass feeling, I think, in the room. And we want to avoid that. So yeah. that's one of our little thingies. Um, at Coachella Big Music Festival, uh, Doppler Labs sold me augmented hearing cool. uh, headphones. And these headphones block the analog audio from getting to your ear. They have microphones on them. Uh, they have processing, and they have speaker. In fact, I have. 
I, I can't show you what I have in my pocket, uh, but I have some headphones that have six microphones on them. Oh. <laughs> and they're using artificial intelligence to find my voice and make it better, all sorts of fun stuff. Um, these Doppler labs, they make the audio better. They're, they're, augment, they're doing to audio what you're doing to, to, the world. to visuals, exactly. right? And when you put them in, keep in mind you're at Coachella and you're in front of $2 million worth of audio gear, so uh, you're having about as good an audio experience as you're ever going to have, right? Because it's pretty badass. But you put these stupid $200 headphones in and all of a sudden that sounds better because it's augmented. You can turn down the volume, you can turn up the bass, you can uh, do all sorts of weird uh, effects. Uh, the yeah. noise canceling on these new products is unbelievable, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. On and on. But what's weird is you take them out and it sounds better. You take them out and the real, the real, the real world, world sounds, sounds better. better. And you put them back in and it sounds better. How uh, can it sound better <laughs> both ways? Depends what you took at Coachella. <laughs> <laughs> Burn. But I was sober with these. He's sober. <laughs> sober. I don't drink anymore, and I, I was not using other things at that point. And, and there's a principle here that our human mind likes analog mm -hmm. and likes augmented. It likes both. And uh, Neil Young's audio engineer took me into his audio lab over here. And he played uh, Harvest Moon off of the two-inch analog tape where it was recorded. In the lab, it was in the oh. studio where it was recorded. And then he had a series of devices where he could sh show me the digital music um, all the way down to 44.1 kilohertz uh, sampled music, which is what's on a CD or sure. MP3 file. You could really tell the difference between that and analog. But Anybody who has a vinyl record collection knows that analog sounds better when you have everything set up perfectly. But I don't listen to analog because it's not convenient, right? My Spotify on my phone has thousands of songs on my phone, right? Here's the thing about convenience. When it gets too convenient, I stop listening to music. It's like a, I, I turn into a phone monkey again, and I'm like, I just lose track of all of the plethora, colossal CD collection. And then I just want to go home and listen. I literally just bought Harvest from Neil Young, the har not Harvest Moon, um, in record form. And I bought a record player like last week. And I feel totally hipster for doing this um, and, and, and odd, actually, because it's so much less convenient. But then I find myself sitting there, isolated in the room, and just listening to it and hearing every little nuance off of the record. So we're, yes, we love uh, analog, and I'm the CEO of an AR company, so it's a, it's a crazy world that we're going where, into. Where I'm going is I believe we're going to take the glasses off a lot to check in. First of all, if you're a supermodel sitting in front of me right now, I'm going to check to make sure, oh, wait a second. <laughs> right? Because right, <laughs> right? right. you're going to be able to portray yourself however sure. you want. I mean, we see uh, already augmented reality mm -hmm. makeup. That ain't going to stop, nope. right? And I can... If I have a slam-based map, it'll make this, augmented. The term I could get rid of you, literally. right? Yeah. I could erase you from my visual world, mm -hmm. right? I could put SpongeBob in it, right? <laughs> if I wanted to, you could be SpongeBob. You, so I'm constantly going to be checking to yeah. make sure that the world is accurate, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I still am going to enjoy that analog wave. We still are a long way from duplicating the na nature's beauty, right? You go to Yosemite. You might want to see that augmented at some places to know the names of the, of the mountains and know the names of the flowers and all the stuff you were talking about. But we're still going to want to take the glasses off and enjoy the analog wave coming I guess off I believe in a symbiotic future where you don't have to take off the glasses, but they're not trying to fool you. And that's the, the nuance. That's all that I talk about. Um, if you design your UI in a way that's natural and that cares about the, the beauty of the world, then you can win. Let's go. Let's go <laughs> deep. I have a, an app on my. We still have time. Uh, on I got my, a two. I got a two-minute signal across yeah. there. We got questions. Yeah, probably about another five or. Five okay. Minutes. Sure. We cool. can go on. Because when we Scoble should. I get to go. It gets a little messy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have a, an app on my Hololens called Fragments, where a murder happens right in the room. So it maps out the room. Yeah. It finds every surface in the room, and puts a murder there. And at one place. There's these artificial rats that are running around the floor. Kay. And because it knows the floor surface, mm -hmm. it runs around your feet. It knows where your feet are because the feet are different than the floor surface, right? And it's freaky. But it's quite enjoyable yeah, to sure. have that happen to sure. you, right? 
So I'm not sure that uh, humans are going to resist this stuff the way you're I, hoping I don't, they do. I don't, I don't um, hope that they will. Um, I just hope that the designers of the operating system of the future won't make a rat or colorful <laughs> ant operating system, but rather that will be left for the, remember I said there were two animals in the future, two UI components that survive into the next generation, tools and content. They become the content of the future. Build your app, your entertainment focused app around this crime scene and let the, you know, the democratic forces of the web dictate how many downloads you have and how successful you are and how much VC money you, you get. And let a lot of people enjoy that experience by their own decision making. And, uh, and that's important. And you'll get the last minute. When I'm in Altspace VR or some of the other social uh, VR spaces, there's going to be infinite rooms or infinite places to go and visit, whether it's a field and you're, there's a rave in the field or a room like this where I'm taking a class or an office where I have multiple monitors around me. Um, how do I find those co the coolest place in the future? Because I, I find I struggle to know where, the, where I should go. Yeah, Because right? it's, it's not like this where uh, people said, oh, you got to come to a room and they direct me and we have lots of structures to get people into place. It's really hard in some of these places. Yeah, it is. It's a, it's a fascinating challenge because I think most people's preconception of what uh, virtual reality will be is, is a contiguous place, right? They read uh, uh, all these uh, Snow Crash and Ready Player One and, and these kind of uh, Bibles of, of virtual reality universes and, and they talk about planets and, and, and places you go and uh, we just think that's sort of nonsense. Um, uh, because the idea of this contigu contiguity of, of a universe is impractical. If I want to go to another place in VR, I should just go there. I don't have to pay somebody to walk into a virtual telephone booth or whatever the hell they do in, in Ready Player One. Um, so, so we see it more as a model of it's, it's the web. You know, where the places you go in Altspace are literally websites. You go to a URL and it downloads all the stuff you need. And, and so the discovery models will be more like you have on the web. You'll find it on social, you'll find it on search, you'll find it that way. Um, so so we, we see embracing how the web developed and, and allowing our tools to help people create these, these interesting places rather than uh, sort of enforcing that it must somehow map to a, a real world. Real fast, w what's one or two things that students should try on a Vive or an Oculus or uh, Gear VR? Yeah, so I mean, I think... Uh, uh, other than your own. Other than, other than our own. Yeah, I think uh, Google Earth is, is, is so cool in, uh, uh, in VR. It's on the Vive, and uh, you can sort of find your, where you grew up and walk around your hometown, and it's, uh, uh, it's just a really, really great thing for a sense of scale. I, you know, I, my favorite thing, honestly, is, is sort of uh, casual gaming. You know, which is totally anathema to where Super VR started. Hot? I haven't played Super Hot yet, uh, but I, I love uh, like Fantastic Contraption, and uh, which is just this, this cool. If I was a kid and I had this, I would just go crazy. I'd be in there all day. Um, but there's this concept that VR is for hardcore gamers because that's where yeah. it came out of, and I just think that's not going to be where it is at all. I think all it's the all kids about under 13 love Job Simulator. Job Simulator is so cool. I mean, it's it's, <laughs> it's all stuff that's it's uh, it's not. I don't think there's been a really successful, maybe one or two really successful hard more hardcore AAA games. All the stuff that's that's really compelling is just is stuff that's like it's the VR equivalent of what an iOS game would be. It's just fun, addictive, lighthearted, uh, whimsical. Uh, there's some great stuff out there. Same question for you. Toothbrush, anatomy viewers. I'm such a like a medical sciences geek that just seeing them photorealistically in front of me, being able to explode a body and look really deep into it is just always gonna make me feel like uh, like a kid. It's um, it's awesome. What, History, what, microbiology, freaking looking up at the stars. When you first put me in augmented reality, uh, you made me, it, it made me cry because I, I realized how much my life was about to change. Why can I remember that feeling and the, the imagery that it's you It's so showed? interesting that um, a lot of people tell us, I will never, ever forget that first 3D hologram that I looked at. Um, the brain remembers novelty. It's a novelty machine. It's never seen a photorealistic object that has no matter, that has no atoms, um, only photons. And that is just um, jarring. And so you'll always remember that. And, and now it's up to the developers to think about how they could use that fact. What is the first image you want to show a billion people in AR or in VR? Because that will never be erased. 
Pokemon. I, uh, Pokemon. <laughs> one way to do it. I think that's demo number one on the new iPhone. Come on. <laughs> Pokemon Hunter. <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah. Thank Pokemon. you very much. Pokemon. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.